Welcome to Land and Learns. Today, we're going to explore the creepiest of crawlies down here in the southeast, and we'll unpack everything from snakes to bugs to lizards to spiders and more. We're going to see about them, learn about them, and then learn about how they impact our ecology and why they're not as bad as I think they are. Let me preface this episode by saying that I am terrified of snakes. I usually don't even say the word snake. I love to call them Mr. No Shoulders, No Ropes, Danger Noodles, all of the above. But I want to be respectful and I want to learn more about the place that I love and the things that live here. And I know they're important. So let's dive into it. Starting off with snakes. First, we have the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. So the way I've encountered this snake is not actually in the wild. I've never seen one out in the wild. Thank the Lord. But I have seen one that my barber had hanging up on his wall that he had mounted because he lives near the National Forest and he had a big old rattlesnake. It was so long and they mounted it on the wall. Now, I don't really want the animals to be dead and I don't want these snakes to be dead either. But that is what happened. And that's the first time I've seen one. And it was just its skin. And I was very afraid of just its skin. But I have recently learned, researching for this episode, that Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes don't bite unless they're provoked. And they even give you a warning. That little rattle, they're warning you. They don't want you to step on them. Their fangs reach an inch long. An inch long. An inch long fang. Take some time and process that. But they're the largest rattlesnake in the southeast and the largest rattlesnake in North America, making them the largest venomous snake in North America. Yikes. Respectfully. Next, we have the Black Racer. I think pretty much everybody I know has a story with the black racer. And science and the internet will tell you that black racers don't actually chase people. They don't do that. Black runners don't chase people. But I was literally, I don't want to call it chase because y'all are going to be like, he wasn't chasing you. He was headed somewhere else. But there's a specific black runner that lives outside my now house that I grew up around. And maybe this is its family member later on in life, but I was... It ran in my direction. That's what we'll say. I can't say it chased me, but it did come in my direction. Now, I do think that is a myth. I don't think it was actually trying to chase me to bite me. I think it maybe was headed a certain direction and I got in its way. I don't know. Snake experts will tell you it did not chase me. So for me, jury's still out on that one, but we're being respectful here and we're going to give them their place. They're good in the environment and we'll get to that a little bit later on. Next, we have copperheads. <sighs> Now, these are an absolute note rope for me specifically. I'm very, very afraid of a copperhead. They're beautiful snakes. They are beautiful snakes. Looks like they got Hershey kisses all over them. But the thing about copperheads is that they are near about invisible, part near invisible, and that's the truth. There's so many photos online of a pile of leaves or a pile of pine straw, and they'll be like, find the snake, and you can't find it. You are not, you're not going to find it in there. It's hiding just as good as it can be. And that's quite disturbing to me. I think my issue with snakes, Mr. No Shoulders, is more about the surprise element than the actual envenomation, if you will. I super don't want to be surprised by a snake. So a copperhead and its very good camouflage, very concerning. I'm super not into them. I respect them from afar. I don't want them near me. And I do remember as a young child, my great-grandmother, who never panicked about anything, panicking about um, one being underneath one of the bushes outside. So not about them. They're beautiful. I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. Respectfully. Next, we got a cottonmouth or a water moccasin. Now let's go ahead and say that that cottonmouth is probably a water snake just a banded water snake. They look very similar. They do look very similar, but a cottonmouth is named cottonmouth because its mouth, if you look inside of it and you don't want to be that close, looks like cotton. Now, they are aquatic occasionally. They live near and in the water. And I remember being younger and going up to our fishing pond and seeing their little white mouths swimming around. Terrifying. They are known in popular lore to be a little bit more aggressive, but science herpetologists, snake people will tell you that that's not true, that they're just headed straight that way. I don't know if you watch Fish and Garrett 
online, but he's constantly walking around in a swamp without shoes. And I've seen him many times be approached by a cottonmouth looking like it was trying to bite him, but then it was just kind of headed in his direction and headed that way. So it, it was not actually chasing him. It was going somewhere else. I personally don't want to be involved with that. I don't want to be involved with a cottonmouth. I don't want to be involved whether it's going past me, whether it's coming towards me. That's not something I'm super into. So those are the snakes we'll focus on today. Let's go back to copperheads for a moment. My sister-in-law got bit by a copperhead. She did. She got bit by a copperhead. And this is going to be even worse for some of you. She got bit by a copperhead through a boot. I know, take some time, clutch your pearls through a boot. One thing about where we live in Mississippi is there's not that much to do all the time, or especially used to be. Now there's a lot of stuff, but you used to could try to find something to do, and that usually involved some sort of pasture or a full wheeler or off-roading of some sort. And she and her now husband went on a date that ended in a pasture, and when she stepped out of the vehicle, she stepped on a copperhead, and it wrapped up around her leg and bit her. It bitter. And that brings us to, now you're not supposed to suck the venom out. In our family, it's a good story. We're proud of my brother-in-law for saving her, sucking that venom out. And I think it did because she got to the hospital and it was all, everything was all okay. But don't do that. Super don't do that. Do not suck the venom out. And there's a couple of reasons. One, yuck. Two, human mouths, are really gross, even if it's your boyfriend. Human mouths are super gross, and it turns out us putting our germs for our mouth on an open wound is almost worse than the venom itself. And then also, you don't want venom in your mouth. So it's kind of just like a double damage type of a situation. Now, I think he did the right thing at that time. This was more than 20 years ago. But don't suck the venom out of a bite that you get. She is fine. She's wonderful today. No lingering effects from the copperheads besides the trauma that I have just from hearing the story. And that's the truth. That's the only snake bites I know about though. So that tells us something. I've lived here my whole life. I've been running around these woods my whole life. When I was a kid, we were up under everything, into everything. Now we have always known that there's a danger, but I never got bit by a snake. My cousins never got bit by a snake. I only know her that got bit by a snake. So maybe we can take some solace in that. All right moving forward and introducing more creepy crawlies. Our next section, insects. Let's get started with one of our most popular insects here that's not even supposed to be here from South America. They came from Argentina and Brazil. Somewhere around the 1930s, they came on cargo ships and they arrived in Mobile Bay, Alabama. So these guys are quite painful and they also are quite invasive. They, they make giant colonies, giant colonies. And if you've ever stepped in one of those anthills, you know what that feels like. Feels like fire. I feel like that's why they're named fire ants. Now they do look a little red. Maybe the name fire came from that a little bit, but fire ants are going to bite the fire out of you or sting the fire out of you. I know it's not technically a bite. If I'm referencing a bite or a sting, those words are kind of interchangeable down here. It's going to bite you, but we know it means sting you. So fire ants are everywhere. And you got to be careful if you're shipping plants or soil across state lines. I feel like they've spread pretty much everywhere, but you can ship fire ants across the country if you aren't paying attention. So you got to pay attention to what you're doing with soil. I think there's rules about that too. So don't ship plants unless you look into it with whoever's in charge of shipping plants. The fire ants are everywhere. They're usually our first experience with intense pain. They also lead us to southern remedies. And that southern remedy is one of two things. Windex or chewing tobacco. I know, I know. Windex is not for wounds, but it is. And it'll do good. It takes the sting right out. And so will chewing tobacco. Gross. I know, I know. And then we're back into like spit being on an open wound. But your grandma and them might put some chewing tobacco on your ant bite, and it's going to feel better. It is. That's just the truth. While we're on ants, let's move to the velvet ant, a cow killer. They're otherwise known as. Now, these are beautiful. I've always thought they were beautiful. I have an ant who got bit by one, stung by one, and so I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind. But if you see one of those, they're usually solitary when you see them, and they're red and beautiful. Now, it's important to note that they are wasps. These are wasps that we're talking about. There's flightless wasps, or at least I've never seen one flying, but they're beautiful. They're velvet, and they've got a little black part of them. 
and they just run around. They're real erratic, so they're really fun to kind of follow around and see what's up with them. If you step in front of it, it'll go around you. They don't want to get involved, but it's said that their sting is painful enough to kill a cow. I don't think that is true. I've never seen a cow die from an ant, but that's what they're known for. That's their reputation, and that's why you got to keep your reputation under control here. You'll end up being called a cow killer when you don't even kill cows. No serious threat posed to humans besides that we will act a fool. And then our last insect for the day is a saddleback moth caterpillar. Now this one caught me by surprise. I've got a son and we play in the yard like you're supposed to. And one day I heard him screaming for his life. It sounded like he was in severe pain and he was. He was really in a lot of pain and it was a saddleback moth caterpillar. And I had never even seen one or maybe I'd seen one, but I never really noticed him much. And I certainly didn't know that they were that painful. It's a painful sting. And it's kind of like cactus hairs. They've got these spikes all over the back of them. And those little spikes will pop you really good. And his got between his feet. So it got him on both feet on the bottom of his foot. And that's something. And that's another reason why we're usually not barefoot in the yard. Because there's ants and stickers and saddleback moth caterpillars. And that's the truth. But they're beautiful. They don't look like they would be a problem. But their color is vibrant. And a lot of times vibrant color in nature means don't touch. And I think that's what it was trying to tell us. Painful, a painful sting. I've never seen him act that way. And he's been stung by all these other bugs. But that one really got him. Quite surprising. Turns into a saddleback moth later on. But when it's a caterpillar, it's going to get you. It'll even cause you to be nauseous. It says extreme pain when you look him up. And it, and it is extreme. But it's got like a saddle on its back. That's how you know it's a saddleback moth caterpillar. Now let's move into spiders. Now currently, we are seeing some golden silk orb weavers also known as a banana spider. We went on the nature trail near the sportsplex now by my house. And there were banana spiders everywhere, like every few feet, two or three banana spiders. And they build big old webs. And they're beautiful. And they're helpful. They eat the bad kinds of bugs. Just like some of the snakes we talked about earlier eat bad kinds of snakes. We'll come back to that. They're beautiful. And their webs are beautiful. And they'll be there for a while, too. If a golden silk orb weaver shows up at your house, you've got some time with it. They're going to stick around and have a good time with you. The way that we do it is that's the spiders now. If they made their home on the porch... That's an orb weaver porch now. That's no longer my porch. And it's just a good agreement that we've got going on. But these are beautiful spiders. They make beautiful webs. You just got to stay out of them. They're real sticky webs. So you got to be real careful. And then moving into a little bit of a spookier, creepier crawlies, we've got the black widow spider. I think you know what a black widow spider looks like. It's got that red little hourglass on its back. And the female black widows are much more dangerous than the males. They'll even eat them after they mate. And that's just really something else. But they rarely cause fatal interactions in humans. And even I've seen a lot of videos where people are really getting in their space on accident and they leave you alone. They don't want to bite. They don't want to. They want you to do your thing and them to do their thing. So they're kind of polite, dangerous, but polite. But usually black widow spiders won't kill you. You could lose an appendage to them. But that brings us to a brown recluse. Now, a brown recluse, again, is a rare kind of a bite. They're not going to just bite you out of nowhere, but I think they're a little bit more aggressive than a black widow spider. And they also will rot your arm right off. I think a brown recluse is probably the thing you got to worry about the most down here. They like to hide in corners. They like to hide in shoes. They like to do all that good stuff. So just kind of pretend you're in Australia. I imagine if I was in Australia, I would be knocking out every sort of boot, really being careful around corners because they've got some things there. But we're talking about here. And I think you should just take that approach. Be sure when you're putting your boots on, if, especially if they've been outside, that you knock them out first. Be real careful, reaching into little holes, getting firewood, all that kind of stuff. That's where they like to live. They are called recluses because they are reclusive. But I've seen a few of those, more than I've seen black widow spiders. So I don't know how reclusive they are. But that's that. We're trying to stick to facts and not feelings. So then let's end out with something a little bit happier. Lizards are little guardians of the garden. Little lizards that we have here are called anoles. There's green anoles and there's brown anoles. Green anoles are native to the southeast, but brown anoles are not. They came from Cuba, and I've seen two ways that they got here. One, cargo ships, and two, hurricanes literally picked them up and flew them over here to Florida, and then they spread from there. But they're cute little guys, and they eat bad bugs. They eat mosquitoes. The other day, we were sitting outside on our deck, and we have a magnolia tree that comes down about a foot from the top of one of the deck posts. And we watched one of those little guys get ready to jump. He like wiggled his tail a little bit to get ready. And he was 
gonna go and then he got scared and he did it over and over for about two minutes it was real cute and he finally made the leap and he did in fact make it to the magnolia tree it was really fun to watch got little personalities those little knolls now if you had a certain type of uncle they put those knolls on their earlobes and wore them as earrings because they'll bite down and stay there it doesn't hurt but it is a little disturbing to see my sister is far more upset about lizards than she is about anything else in the world she's not about them but they are a little adjacent to snakes to me they have little snake looking mouths but they're a lot friendlier their mouths look a little snakish so i'm not super about them but i'm not scared of them i will catch one now their tails will fall off but they grow back and that's really a good trick my cats frequently take their tails they don't get to go outside but if one wanders inside they're gonna lose a tail at minimum unfortunately so listen so we've got some common misconceptions about these things about snakes is that they're very aggressive snakes are not super aggressive if you stay out of their territory and even if you get in their territory they don't want to bite they want to get out of there and i'm talking to the choir here because i am the problem i think that they're so scary I used to couldn't even look at them in a magazine but i'm working on that i'm working on understanding their place in our ecology and that's why things like black runners and king snakes are so good and you never want to kill one of those because they eat the snakes that could get to you, like copperheads, all those other kinds of snakes, king snakes and black racers. Eat those. So if you see those kinds of snakes in your yard, let them be, or you might end up seeing other kinds of snakes in your yard, actual danger noodles. Then our second misconception is about those spiders. It's that they're frequently deadly, and that is just simply not true. They rarely result in fatalities because we've improved so much our medical treatments and the treatments are really effective now. So if you can get to somewhere that can take care of you, you're going to be just fine probably. I say probably because you never know, but it's a misconception. They're not as deadly as they seem. Our next misconception is that even though fire ants are invasive and stinging caterpillars are scary, they all have a place in our ecology. Now, they are not native, but that's kind of how the world works now. We're a global society, and so are a lot of these animals, including fire ants, and they have a role. They aerate the soil for us, and those stinging caterpillars have evolved that sting so that they can grow into moths and pollinate all the things for us. So there's a reason for all this stuff. Encounters with these guys may seem frequent, especially in the southeast, but most of them are not dangerous unless they're provoked, and that's hard pill for me to swallow because I sure am scared, but most snake bites and insect stings happen by accident, like you stepped on a snake or you brushed against a spider web. So each year, around seven to 8,000 people are bitten by venomous snakes, but the fatalities are extremely rare, and seven, 8,000 people sounds like a lot, but compared to all the millions of people that live here, that's really not that many. So... Let's discuss creepy crawlies. What do you think about all these that we talked about today? We'll talk about more in the future, but I want to know what you think about them. What misconceptions have you learned are no longer true? I feel like we learned a lot more lately about these things. We've learned that they have a role and they have a purpose and that they're trying to leave us alone. We're all just doing our best out here, and so are these little creepy crawly guys. So it's my hope that by diving in, understanding them a little more, understanding their place here, we can maybe form a better relationship with them. It's like focusing on the positive, focusing on the balance that they bring to us. So let's discuss it. Creepy crawlies. Have you ever had an interaction with one of these? Was it very scary? Are you still very scared of danger noodles, nope ropes? And what do you call them? What do you think about black widows and brown recluses being a little bit less dangerous than we once thought? Do you believe that? It's hard for numbers to lie. I still personally don't want to mess with them, but now we know. What's your experience with them? I love learning with y'all. Let's keep it up. If you've got a topic that you want to learn about, let us know below. I'll learn, and so can y'all. We can learn together. That's all for today's episode of Land and Learns.